as I was saying earlier on, I mean, in the art school, we had a lot of um, very large egos, and they were like, the, the, the tutors were like rock stars, or at least they saw themselves that way. <laughs> and, uh, but Kerry wasn't like that. Uh, when you spoke to Kerry, you just knew this guy really loved uh, painting. And he, he loved, uh, he just had a passion for the thing. When you ask Kerry a question, whether it was a technical question, whatever, he was always incredibly helpful. And the other thing was, I, I actually could see Kerry's uh, paintings every year at the uh, Royal Iberian Academy annual show. And so I knew this was the work he was doing, because a lot of the tutors, again, you, you, you mightn't have seen the work. And I respected the work. I really admired his, his talent, his skill, the way he, he put, you know, the work was so beautifully made. Um, and of course, and, and Kerry will talk about it later on, later on, the whole idea of harmony was a major thing in his, in his work. Well, that's very nice, Raphael. You know, I enjoyed working in the College of Art, especially as a student, because I was out of school. It was wonderful to be out of school. And uh, I was in a boys' school. And then, of course, when you went to the College of Art, there were dances and there were girls and there were all kinds of fun and games in your late teens and early 20s. And I just thought it was the best thing in the world. And everybody was drawing and more passionate about it. And the tutors were very uh, interesting. And Keating had a studio, uh, which after a while then he left. And McGonagall or John F. Kelly had that studio subsequently. And, uh, you know, I never quite got a studio in the college, really. But uh, that's because times changed. Mm. And we left the building. The building uh, which I studied was in Kildare Street. It's now part of government buildings behind the National Library. You know, so. Yeah. That's a good idea, the idea of a studio. Um, again, because I think that's a very important part of uh, teaching would be that the, the student can see what you're doing. But certainly Keating, he, he, he painted, he got people to pose for him in his studio. And then uh, I remember one particular uh, painting he did, a flower, a flower seller. And uh, he had her up uh, and uh, she had to wear certain clothes that Keating wanted her to wear. But he, he had a big bowl of, she had a big bowl or bucket of flowers next to her. And he was working away on that for wow. a month or so, you yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, different times, all right. But uh, I found McGonagall a more interesting teacher than Keating. Keating would come along and he'd say, mm, mm, well, that's not bad. OK, carry on. OK. You know, and uh, McGonagall would come along and he'd look and he wouldn't say something. And then he'd say something. And then he'd come back and he'd see, would you respond to what he'd said? And all of that kind of thing. But uh, uh, McGonagall was more interested uh, in contemporary art than Ke yeah, uh, yeah. Ke uh, Keating was, yeah. Keating believed anything past the uh, end of the 18th or middle of the 19th century uh, was perhaps almost too much for him. McGonagall was fascinated by the Impressionists and the post-Impressionists, and he found ways when he painted the landscapes in the west of Ireland to, uh, uh, to try and find his own way of being part of the... Uh, uh, the contemporary scene, as it were. Mm. But uh, I remember that he brought in a reproduction of Picasso's uh, Guernica, and uh, he put it up on the wall, and he talked about this and talked about the rhythms and the expression of the anguished people and the horse and the bull and all of that. So he, I don't think he was trying to force us into contemporary ways, hmm. but... Uh, making you aware of You know, he was making yeah. us aware of, yeah. In there was fact, also a, a John Kelly, Big John. Big John. We, there was a John Kelly, who was Little John, who was in the printing department, a great guy, wonderful painter as well. And then there was Big John, and John, Big John was a, an absolute brilliant draftsman. I think you have stories about Big John. Well, you know, he asked me to pose for him once, and uh, he did a drawing of me. It was for something else. It was just the attitude. He was painting a portrait or something. 
But Big John, could, there, as I say, two, we, Little John and Big John. Big John was John Festus Kelly, and uh, he painted uh, portraits for the most part. And then small still lifes, like Cezanne's method, hmm. not, yeah, Cezanne's method, uh, when he got towards the end of his life. But uh, he was appointed head of painting uh, in 1968, after Morris McGonigal walked out. It was Morris McGonigal was challenged in the antique drawing room by uh, a particular student. I was saying, what are we doing all this for? Blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And McGonigal said, well, this is what you're doing it for. If you don't want to do it, that's all right by me. And uh, McGonigal said, I'm 68 years of age. Why do I have to listen to such rubbish from students who know sweet F all? <laughs> and uh, that was it. Uh, walked out, never came back into the college again. My goodness. But Keating, after he left, he retired uh, in 1959 when I uh, got my diploma. And uh, he used to come in as a part-time teacher in the evening, maybe one night a week, and he could teach anatomy in his skeleton, and he could draw from the skeleton beautifully, and he knew where all the muscles were, and he did a demonstration on the blackboard and things mm. like that. Yeah. But Keating, in some respects, had to do that, because he was only a part-time teacher, even though he was had a painting for quite a number of years, you know? And if he didn't sell, you know, that was it. Well, that's actually a thing, too. I think, it, you know, if, if you're a painting, um, how do you make a living, you know? Yeah. And I mean, obviously, the idea would be to get some kind of a part-time job in an art school. And uh, I was lucky to get a job in a boarding school. And because of that, I could, you know, do most of my work in the evenings, I mean, teaching in the evenings. Uh, and then I had most of the days to, to paint away. And I didn't have to worry about making the work saleable or, you know, churning out a, a body of work, whatever. I just could concentrate and just do what I wanted. Yeah. And um, myself and Richard over here were, were both uh, teachers up there, and, and um, it was great. Actually, it really was a great uh, thing to have, you know. And it also made your, meant you were in contact with uh, students, and you, you know, you were getting your ideas kind of formed, which was nice. Yeah, well, that's it. And I was lucky because uh, I had sent a couple of portrait drawings into the academy, and they were accepted. And my tutor. Uh, uh, the late Des Stevenson, he died of cancer when he was in his early 40s. And they needed somebody to come in and teach drawing from the antique. And that's what happened. Uh, McGonigal got in touch with me and said, would you like to come in and teach drawing from the antique? It'll be 17 hours a week or 17 and a half hours. Mm -hmm. If you worked 18 hours, they'd have to make you permanent. So it was 17 and a half hours, you know? And uh, I did that for five years. Wow. Uh, from 63 to 68. And then things were changing in the college, and I was decided to uh, appoint and make a number of part-time teachers full-time. And they had a competition in painting, and you know, also for uh, people who taught in stained glass, pottery, and all of this, all the crafts. And uh, they were going to create five uh, full-time members. And in fact, they only created well, two, two and a half. I got one. Myra Maguire was appointed uh, uh, head of core studies or, or assistant teacher in design. And Fergus Ryan, he was in his early 60s and he was appointed part-time uh, to teach lithography. Mm. Uh, and, and that was it. Any questions? Yeah, it was interesting. I, I, I like both paintings, I must say. Uh, I think that I'm able to say more about what I was doing uh, in the later painting, which is the snow scene, 
And uh, I'd been inspired by Cezanne, who painted a lot of his uh, landscapes and used the mountain of Mont Saint Victoire uh, in uh, uh, Provence. And uh, it was during a break in the Easter holidays, and I went off with a couple of canvases, went up to Donegal, and uh, discovered this particular subject uh, with the cottages and Aragal behind and uh, so on. And I painted a little picture, a quarter size of that, on the spot in one afternoon. And I was really pleased with it because it was nice, light, harmonious colors, mostly warm, dried grass, like the dried grass and that over there. And uh, a blue sky and there was an aeroplane just came in with a contrail. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, put that in, you know. And uh, then I went up with Hilda and our two daughters. We went up to uh, Port New in 71. And uh, I went over to paint the summer picture. And I spent, you know, a number of different days working on it. Uh, I didn't go over every day, obviously. but And then I actually painted it, and I quite liked it. And then. Kieran McGonigal saw it in my studio and he said, give me that, I'll be able to sell it for you. And like anything else, you could take the offer. And uh, I actually haven't got the painting, but I, I have a, a photograph of the summer uh, painting, uh, which I quite like. Oh dear. Sorry for being so uh, messy. Here we are. You can see, and the thing that interested me uh, in, in the summer painting was that the whole time I was up there, I hardly saw Aragal at all, uh, because there was cloud that was always coming across the top of it. And then I liked the shape of the mountain here, and then I realized that it echoed the shape of the potato drills down below at the bottom. Uh, so I, I, you can see that I echoed that, and I quite I liked the harmo harmony of the greens. And then I thought, well, I'd better go up in the, uh, at the autumn, and uh, I wasn't going to paint, and the autumn it was wild and windy. And uh, so I don't know whether I sat in the car, I got out, and I did a drawing of the potato pits here, and I took some photographs, and uh, People who bought this picture, they liked it with the potato pits in it. The interesting thing was that uh, uh, the sunlight, uh, the first one I took, you can see the potato pits there, and the color of the fields, it's all auto uh, autumnal. Uh, but uh, then the same day, at, you know, the way. Uh, the weather transforms the landscape. And here there was a burst of sunlight on the mountain itself, and all the foreground was dark. So I thought that was a good idea, I did the drawing. And then I worked that out, uh, and I was pleased with that. It's, it's more broadly painted than the later one. But uh, the people who bought it actually thought it was snow on Aragon, yeah. but it's yellow. Look at the difference between the snow and that. And you can see from, you know, the photograph gives you certain kind of information, but it doesn't give you the kind of information that you need. It, 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 it's a sort of a reminder uh, of a particular place, of a particular sense that you get when you look at a thing over a period of time. And you can see from this, you can see how shallow the height of the mountain is there. And I raised it up, and then I raised it up on this as well, though I haven't got any photographs of the, uh, of the winter one. But uh, what I liked when I went up to see the winter one, I loved the fact that the mountain itself was covered in snow, and the foreground wasn't, uh, and there was bits of snow, and then there was uh, bits of grass, and uh, you know, there was a little drain sort of thing and peeping through. And I like that contrast between the whiteness, uh, the blue sky, uh, 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 and the pine trees. Of course, you can see the slight difference in scale, and slightly different position of the, the actual cottages. 
the cottages now are gone, you know. And in fact, underneath the right pine tree on the left, just there, completely to the right-hand side, is a bungalow. And they'd cleared that particular space where they had a lawn and something else. So I, I invented that for the harmony of the picture, you know? So that, and I, you know, I have a feeling now that I might quite go back and paint a large summer one from the photographic image that I have here of it, you know? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, yeah, okay. Well, first of all, I mean, way back, I would actually used to do quite a lot of landscape myself, but about 22 years back, I was becoming more involved with the very simple uh, issues of, um, well, how do you actually arrange optics in a rectangle in a, in a uh, picture? And um, I think that was something that was always on my mind. So because of that, I started thinking about still life, because obviously you could use those objects uh, and move them around and so on and so forth. And then when you do that, they, they take a little life of their own. I used a, a, a geometric process. I used very simple mathematical ratios to kind of organize the thing. And I know people would often say, well, that's kind of um, very controlling and so on and so forth. But in actual fact, it, it, keeps, it puts me out of the loop and to some extent. I'm actually on the passenger seat, and the mats is on the driving seat, moving things along. And for example, that painting back here, the two two jugs, and that idea, the idea that came from uh, looking at a Leonardo da Vinci's painting of uh, the Annunciation. He painted when he was quite young, and I was looking at the shape of the picture, and I was trying to work out having any geometric, because he was a great mathematician. And I was trying to figure out how to, what was the maths, what was the geometry behind the picture. And initially I thought it was going to be this uh, root five rectangle, which is a lovely long rectangle, but it, it's not. So I started, I came up with a, 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 an idea anyway, which I am not saying is the right idea, but it was based on a series of uh, root twos. Um, so I wanted to do a painting where, because in the Da Vinci painting, the angel and, the, and Mary are, Opticize the painting, and there's this space in the middle. So I want to do a painting when the objects are together. So this is like a visitation. This is like Mary and Elizabeth coming together, and you've got this big space around it. But it's, it's as much as I can work out the same shape as Da Vinci's painting, not the same size by any means. And um, the idea was that uh, if you drew a rectangle around the, the two um, jugs, it creates a square, a perfect square. And of course, the diagonal of the, the square is a root two, and that's the height of the picture. And there's other little things coming out from that. So it's the idea of these two uh, women coming together. And they're, obviously, the jugs represent a symbolic of that because they're uh, pregnant. They're, they're, they're a vessel that can hold something. In, in the, and so this idea, they come together. And like in the story, they are the most important people in, like, in the whole narrative. You know. And so I think that was a very nice idea to these, you know. And it's almost like that they're, they're, they're doing a slow dance. You know, and that was the idea of that. So it, it, it's the way the geometry can work it out and give, give them a, a sense of um, unity. I think you don't have to understand the geometry. Like, I think in the same way, if you listen to a piece of music, and there might be a lot of structure in the music, well, you don't have to understand it, but you know it's there, you know. But that painting uh, on Carrie Summer Techniques, that, I had a lot of trouble with that painting. I spent a long, long time, and it was a white jug, and just trying to get those values. Uh, because what you think you see and what you actually see are very different things. So I struggled quite a lot to try to get those values. And, and that's, the, that's the nature of the beast, really. That's what that's it's all about. You just never know what goes on in no. an artist's mind, do no. you? Even we, even we don't, <laughs> you. <laughs> but... <laughs> Anyway, did you ever, you see, that's the thing about trying to get maximum light into a painting, or maximum dark. The two extremes are black and white. And uh, 
colors all in between. Sometimes you can mix uh, a color that's taken from blue and orange, let's say, and you add a little bit more blue into the orange or a little bit more orange into the blue. So you get a range of tonalities like yeah. that. But you can do it with red and, uh, red and green or purple and violet, and they've all different uh, color theories and everything. But the interesting thing about observing something, it depends on what you see it against. If, if you're looking at a volume, let's say, well, you use the white jug, but supposing, you know, you have a little bowl there with uh, 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 berries in it, you know, and that has a particular quality mm. of, of light and dark. And you, we can never get the full range of light no. in a painting because the whole spectrum is very wide. And if you, mix, if you mix up colors, you, black and white, all the colors, if you, I remember thinking, oh, if I added all the colors together, what wonderful color would I get? No, of course. Well, it's subtractive color. Yeah. You just get a gray, muddy mass. So when you're painting in color, you have to be very selective about the intensity of the color, the purity of the color. How can I gray that or make it softer? Uh, or make it sing. And sometimes it needs the contrast of either a complementary color or a contrast of uh, light, dark contrast or tone to make it work. Yeah, yeah. You and know? You, and uh, we're that, experimenting with that uh, all exactly. the time. Exactly, and when you're looking at, um, you're saying that, we're looking at the subject, like the, I'm doing a painting, that's, there's one around the corner of, of the subject, where there's actually a light in the picture. <laughs> so it's like I'm listening to a piece of music that has the full range of a grand piano. And I've got a little accordion or something, something that has a much Two smaller range. In the middle. And I ain't going to have to get that melody, that big thing, yeah. but within these couple of octaves. You know, so, and, um, so you're looking at the tonal value, you're looking at the actual color itself and the intensity of that color. And so, and as, you know, you're really trying to make, you know, and that's a battle because there's no one solution to that. No, but you never get it right no. at first. You no. get an approximation at first. Then yeah. you evaluate the approximation and then you make another adjustment and then you evaluate that and you make another adjustment until you arrive at a position where you know that you can't get that contrast yeah. or balance any better than you're doing it. And then, then you can say, well, I can leave that alone, or that's as good as it's going to get, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, like, that's something I've been probably spending a lot of time thinking about um, is the issue of color. And um, ex like, in particular, when you're. Daylight is beautiful and it's very, very subtle. You know, and the, the ranges are incredible. And I've, I've been painting white cloth for that reason because it's so subtle. Um, and you really could spend a lifetime just thinking about those, just yeah. those issues. Because it all depends on the amount of light that you get to fall in that cloth. Yeah. And what are the contrasts of value or the contrasts of color around it, you know? Yeah, it's like, like, it, it, it's like singing a song. And, you know, when you start, you make sure you can sing the highest note and the lowest note. That's so it. You, you find your range and say, right, this is where I'm going. And so you need to know, with the painting, well, can I hit that high note and can I hit that low, you know, the That's low right. note? And, but it's, if, if, it, if, if there was a solution to it, I think it would all be, we give up, we wouldn't bother. It's the fact that there are no ultimate solutions to this thing, that you, you, each painting is an attempt at dealing with that issue. And then you get it so far in that painting and then you go, okay, well maybe I'll, you know, and another idea comes from that. And that's what keeps me going. Like, yeah, but you're always looking morning, at, yeah. at different artists mm. through the ages all the time. Oh, what did he do? How yeah. did he do that? How, oh, wow, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it, it's, you all, I'm always looking at art. Yeah. Uh, 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 and you know, interestingly, when I went to the College of Art first, I was 17, and I, my uncle, uh, my mother's eldest brother, uh, made a bit of money in the States. And he asked my mother, would, 
she liked to go out with me for a holiday. And we went to Boston. He met us in Boston. He bought a farm up in, the, in New Hampshire, and he wanted my father to go out and run the farm for him. But, you know, I was in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And then we flew out uh, eventually to uh, Chicago and uh, to visit my mother's younger brother. And I was in the Art Institute of Chicago because I was fascinated by Renoir's great painting of the Chapon Madame Chaponti and her children, you know? And these are the people that we were fascinated by. I, I was at that age, you know, uh, because they were close to us in the sense that they were more recent paintings than, let's say, the dull paintings that yeah, one yeah. might imagine one saw that weren't very interested to young people when you went into a national gallery, you know? But then we were lucky enough to come back to New York and I went to other galleries in New York. And I remember when I went into the College of Art, I had a book on Degas and I had a book on, on Monet. No, nobody had, there was no, no, it was hardly, there was a library in the College of Art, it was in the design section and they had uh, mostly books on design. Amazing. And I remember going around saying, look, this is what, you know. And then McGonagall got uh, some Skira books, uh, Skira the uh, Swiss publishers, and they brought out some interesting books on Matisse, and you know, so we were looking at the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists and things like that. But, you know, we didn't see, <laughs> we didn't see very much of, uh, you know, of the German Expressionists no. at the same time. They just yeah. hadn't. You know, yeah, about yeah. I mean, one of the most interesting artists uh, for us was uh, uh, that great Austrian draftsman. Oh, what's his name? He died when he was 18, or 29. And uh, he was worked with Klimt. Egon Schiele. Egon Schiele. Schiele. E Egon Schiele, yeah. And like, you know, they got a book out on Egan Sheely's drawings. drawings. Yeah. And it was so amazing. They were totally different from the life drawings that you'd see Orpen do or even any of the contemporary masters, you know. They were fantastic to look at. But that was like 20, 30 years later, yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? And now I think the gallery has a, uh, the National College of Art has a wonderful library. You know, everything's gone digital. Remember, I remember I, years, and this is about 40 years now ago, and I, um, I think it was Charlie Brady who'd done a, a talk on Mirandi, the, the, the Italian uh, yeah. painter. And there was a great exhibition of Mirandi's prints in uh, Douglas Hyde at the same right. time. But there was this, two, I think it was a two volume book, books on, on Mirandi, big thick things on, I think it was everything he'd done. Yeah. Uh, both the prints and the paintings. And that yeah. was, I remember spending you know, afternoons just looking at those things. But the interesting thing about those Morandis were that they actually had a standard size and they would actually show a little relationship of scale to the image. So you knew, oh, it's this size, but yeah. the other is a bigger one or whatever. You know? But the thing about Morandi, I love Morandi's work. And he was brilliant because he used to pile a whole lot of things together. They're always, yeah. So, yeah, like, like that. Huddled so up that together, was, yeah. That was the whole idea of compression. You know, and we tend to, you have little compressions here and there, yeah, but, but you also have space. Keep them away, yeah. I mean, that's exactly. a compression down there, yeah. but that's dealing with yeah, the, yeah. the, the separation. And, I, and that's a big thing for me, is the idea that you have, and obviously it becomes a different thing now with, with COVID, but the idea of these groups, and then you've got maybe a, something separate some objects separate from that. Yeah. And so like a psychological thing going on, there's almost like a, it's a kind of a tableau from a play or something, you know, and you're looking at well, what's going on here, you know? Um, and yeah, but Mirandi always had them. They were like huddled up. Yeah. Uh, and uh, kind of were getting the strength from being together almost. Yeah, but then there was Beautiful a, paintings, a, a, absolutely gorgeous. And the etchings are just oh, yeah, extraordinary. Yeah, wonderful, and wonderful. That, they look, when you look at them, you say, oh my God, these, these look so easy. And they're not, because I've tried to do etching, <laughs> and the subtlety in them is just incredible. You know, really it beautiful, is, beautiful. It is, yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, I also w w was influenced, and still am influenced, by the abstract painters, um, and you know, um, Mondrian would have been, and because he, he, he literally 
took, a paint, took the painting and brought it right down to its you know, skeleton almost. Yeah. And said, right, so you have, you know, you've got just the primary colours and a horizontal and vertical. Um, black, maybe white, you know, and that, that was it. And it, it was this idea of just taking these very, very, very simple elements and that was your building block. It shows you that you can paint a very interesting painting mm. even by just using basic design. If you choose the balance of, of shape within the format and make that interact with some other color which is either completely harmonious or uh, completely exactly. different. Yeah. But, and it was that limitation that I loved. Yeah. And so when I decided then, you know, well, I, I didn't actually decide, but it happened that I was doing still lifes. Yeah. And like, I wasn't collecting anything fancy, it was very ordinary objects. Um, and it was that thing that, yeah, you know, you can limit yourself as much as you like and you still have a world, you, have a, you know, it, it, you still have so much to do with, it, with those few things. And they haven't run out of ideas yet, so. Yeah, well, uh, there's one Morandi that I'll read, uh, not Morandi, but uh, Mondrian. Uh, uh, Mondrian is uh, Broadway oh, Boogie beautiful. Woogie. Ah, oh, great piece. That's one of my Absolutely great favorite piece. Uh, yeah. I love the way he actually it's turned the square paint on line, the diagonal. Uh, yeah. and, but I mean, because like, who was it he wouldn't talk to because this guy painted the diagonal? Uh, Van Duisburg, uh, another. Van Duisburg, yeah. yeah. And he wouldn't speak to him again because he painted the diagonal. <laughs> and, but what he did was he got the picture and toned it so it became a, a diamond shape of that. And then he had, so there were still horizontal and verticals. Apparently he used to go to um, have coffee when he was living in New York um, with another artist. And they were sitting they were near Central Park, I think on Fifth Avenue. But he always kept his back to the trees because he didn't want to see nature. That's which is really interesting because he painted these beautiful trees at the start of his <laughs> career. But it was just, all he wanted this, it was this, you know, he probably loved the order of he had plenty of verticals in New York. Yeah, anyway, yeah, he just loved that. Know? And um, so that became his life. That became his world. And I love that idea that something, a few things can become your whole world, you know? I heard about a Japanese artist who lived in New York and he wanted to train his memory because most artists' memories are not brilliant, you know? They have to be uh, fostered. And my memory drawing is not brilliant by any means, but I can tell you that this Japanese artist, he decided to go down and draw the street or the avenue, uh, you know, and the cars and everything, he'd go down and he'd look at it for 10, 15 minutes uh, or longer, and then he'd go back up to his studio. And the studio was on the 14th floor of a, a skyscraper. So he said, it, it was a great training because by the time you did this half a dozen times, you, you wanted to remember everything that you could put in the drawing, you know? Because I think for anybody who knows Rayfield and Carey, they're also friends as well as being former uh, tutor and, and student. But to thank you both this evening uh, for a really informative talk. Um, it's like being fly on the wall. <laughs> it's like that we're not really here. But thank you so much. And just to say uh, thank you to the audience here and thank you to the audience at home. Yeah. Okay. Okay.